like that. You cannot create an earthquake to get the results from that experiment. So this type of there are several examples where we need the data point, but we cannot perform the actual physical experiment. A solution to that approach is creating a virtual reality kind of a thing so that you can create a virtual design space where you perform the experiment and get the simulation results. So the whole devolution is involved with these three columns. What are the some application? Here you can see like what is the astronomy application like how do we calculate the lifetime or kind of a interaction between different galaxy elements. Similarly, prediction of tornado or any earthquake effect or even in some I think mountain area or biological applications. So those kind of thing, there are a couple of challenges here. If you see here, these are kind of a not physically recreatable problems. In a second is the number of data points is very large because it's in the order of millions or something like that. So our conventional mathematics kind of a limitation with respect to the computational resource or time. For example, if you want to perform the matrix inversion, very basic problem, which is a cubic order problem. Now, if you have a 1 million data, it's a 1 million cube to the resource. That's a long and not a practical problem. So for this application, we need to develop certain algorithm we can perform using MATLAB for the scientific computing. So these are the basic step by step processes. Most of the cases is a sequential, some cases is it has iterative process to improve the accuracy. So first definitely the modeling of the problem. Now to model a particular phenomena like a heat transfer problem or any stress strain problem in materials, you need to follow a particular mathematical equation. So that comes under the numerical treatment section. Now if you have the equation in pen and paper, you have to implement in the computer. So for that case, you need the coding site that is the implementation category. Once you implement everything in a particular digital platform, you want to visualize the results. So in that case, MATLAB can be quite useful for easy to use various kind of visualization techniques are there. Finally, getting the results, you want to integrate in a system like you have a large system like you can think of this large coil means LHC program, which has several kind of scientists who are in different small, small projects. If you to combine such small project outcomes to a bigger results, you need a block simulation. In that case, simulating can be an alternate solution. So these are the basic advantages of MATLAB compared to the other thing. It's kind of the terminology very similar to the, our, our mathematics textbook, whatever we read, like a sine function is defined by sine only, something like that. Second is that you can convert it easily to other platforms, C++ or Python. You can easily convert any MATLAB code to there and the vice versa is also possible. Third is the text support thing because it has a very, unlike most of the uh, simulation software, it has a very well documentation literature available open source. So anyone can go and try out those and ask questions. So this kind of advantages are there. So whenever we talk about MATLAB, it is the name actually coming from Matrix Laboratory. So Matrix means it's not just involves only numerical data. There can be different types of data points you think one is definitely the structure of the data that can be a single number like a scalar or it can be one column vector or a row vector that's a one dimensional data if you have more dimensional then you can go to arrays or kind of matrix configuration but what are the data types one is definitely the numerical like two three or any floating number 2.1 something like that Second one is the string that is primarily to the textual analytics part you need, but sometimes whatever the results we get from other softwares that has some text data. So those data are generally read as a string or character just like C. And finally the function. Function will be very useful for your custom program because sometimes most of the times actually we don't have the function available in the library. So based on our numerical formulation we write a function here. So if it is available, that's very good, like sine cos function, exponential function, those are the common functions available there. Those are called built-in functions. Second is user-defined function, so you can custom a function whatever you want to do. Third one is manual entry, like you have the exact outcomes of the function, you can enter it as a array or matrix. That's the other way to enter. Now all these three types or three, four types of data points, beyond that there are other 
application like you, you can read the image which is nothing but a matrix data similarly you can read the audio signal which is also kind of a array of numbers so those kind of data can be converted from one form to another and the other thing that i would like to mention here like any type of data you can convert from frequency domain to time domain because sometimes the resolution is higher in one domain it's quite poor in the other domain so these kind of things you can convertible the other thing is the conversion of data type from among these two main main two three converts also possible so for example if you need a very short data which is the by default format so up to four decimal or five decimal it gives you the results but for more accurate numbers if you want to go for you can just set up the format as a long so it is stick to the precision level quite high you can see here this is kind of a useful like a number like exponential e value or pi value this kind of thing you can use the format long to get more accurate results other thing i was talking about like converting from one data type to the other data type so yeah then suppose you have a number of string like string array is there you want to convert them or concatenate them one after another so that is also possible by using the string operation the other thing is from string to we want to convert it into a kind of matrix format or numerical format or if you have a already a matrix data and you want to convert into the string format that is also convertible using different built in functions are there like mat to string just converts a matrix to the characters whenever i am talking about matrix that's kind of a numerical data i am talking about similarly number to the string also you can do and all those thing and other is from the text to the numbers like sometimes in the third party tools you get the results from simulation or whatever by measurement results it comes in the form the first row gives you the parameter names so that's a kind of a string or character so if you want to convert that to your favorable data format you can use different kind of a thing because every string or character data has a particular ascii code you can convert accordingly but you don't have to write down the entire conversion code yourself just use a, this small command and it will perform the whatever you want so those goes for the um, different types of data but even in numerical numbers also there are different number system like binary decimal or hexadecimal kind of a thing generally we used a decimal format but if you are choosing on a different digital system or something like that you have a data point in the decimal hexadecimal point or binary system results you need specifically for the digital application sometimes you will convert it into the binary format you can use this kind of data formation within the number data itself so data type remains the same but the base of the data that changes from 2 to 10 to 16 whatever you want to do last one is kind of a data type detection problem so it's very similar to the c like if you have a data you want to check whether this data type is character or string or number so if you want to check whether it's a character data we can just run this built in function is char if is char output is one then your data is basically a character data if it's not it will come out to be zero similarly if it is a string you can call a is string operation or a string function otherwise you can do other operation thing also uh alternately if it's a scalar data you can add scalar afterwards so if it's a vector you can do the vector thing so this kind of easy to understand means from the command line we can understand what operation we are going to perform so that's kind of advantage in the matlab perspective now once you have a set of data set sometimes you want to manipulate the data like combining in different format like joining or splitting a data set kind of a thing that is also performable using a different english like comments like join command just if you have two string s1 and s2 you just run a command join s1 comma s2 that will give you the combined string that is s1 s2 uh, so similarly if you have a, for example you have a two characters or two string one is metallurgy second one is engineering so s1 is metallurgy second one is engineering s2 just run those two s1 comma s2 join then it will just give you metallurgy engineering kind of operation it gives so this thing are actually useful on the visualization side mainly because sometimes we need a nice visualization of whatever the results we get so the title or the column or x or y column we need to give a meaningful numbers as well as the meaningful names those kind of operation you can do 
Similarly, for particular position of data you want to extract or you want to sort the data points, you can learn all these comments are there. Second is you have a two data set, let's say. So how they are actually, if you want to compare whether they are actually same data or not, you can run like a, you have two strings. You want to match that they are matching or not. So for then you can just run a common string compare that is HTML CMPI. Now, what's the application? For example, you have a large text data set. You want to compare there is a particular word is available in that data set or not. So you just run a com string compare and you can find out what is the indexes, what that particular word is present in the data. This kind of a person can be performed easily. Now coming back to our mathematics side, we have the standard function, whatever we study in our trigonometry or, or basic mathematics books, sine, cos, tan, all are available. Similarly, if you want to perform the inverse operation, a cos or a sine or a tan is available. Default log function is log 2 divided by base e, and if you want to perform 10 base log, you can call the log 10. Similarly, if you want to round up a particular number to your nearest integer, like if you have a float number 1.3467, you want to get the nearest integer, you can call the round up so that which will give you one as output. Similarly, if you have a long data point, you want to perform the reminder, so you can do not perform manually the division operation, so you can just call the rem function. Similarly, if you have a series of data of x, which you which are complex numbers. So you want to find the phase of that each complex number, you just run angle. But just to be careful here, just whenever you run a new comment, type help of the comment name, which will give you the details. For example, in angle of x, it will give you the angle in basically radian format. So if you want to convert that to again degree, you have a comment called rad to dig. That is convert the radian to the degree operation. So whatever the doubt you have, you can just type, we'll do some hands on can understand how we understand the common details and inputs and all these things. And there are the some numerical constant we commonly use that is also available there up to a certain level. If you want more accurate numbers, you have to set the format equals to long. So numerical data side points, very basic one is to definitely scalar one single number. But if you have a series of data like a sequence along one axis, that's a vector. It can be row vector, it can be column vector, anything. And if you want to do the transfer operation, that is also powerful. It is just a, to divide T or dash operation that gives you a row transformation or column transformation. Next is coming instead of one single dimension data, you have a multiple dimension data. It can be two dimensional, it can be three dimensional. Here we are taking just a two dimensional matrix. And you see here, that's how we are storing here. And similar to the C or Python, so not much difference. But once you have the matrix, suppose you want to play around the matrix data point. Like I have one, three and two, four column. I want to flip them up, like upper to the lower row or the left to the right hand side column. So that is also possible. If you remember the approach, every MATLAB comment, we just directly take the English word. So if you want to flip, then the first comment definitely will flip. And if you want to do the up to down, then UD, flip UD. So that's what it's doing. You see here, the first and second row are just uh, toggled together. And if you want to do this thing for the left and right column, so that is LR. So flip is common and LR is just for left and right thing. So that's easy to under interpretable. Next one is more complex operation, like if you have a data point 3 cross R, but you want to resize it to some your specific data structure, like instead of 3 cross R, you want a 2 by 6 dimension. So you have a function called recip that will convert this to this thing. So how does it read actually, if you notice here, it starts reading from your first towards the rows actually. So first column is done. Then it starts from the second column like that way. So one and two goes for the first two rows, second, three and four, that goes to the second column like that way. So the reading is like this one, and it's a left towards, so downwards and left towards. That's the tradition we follow in the MATLAB. But you can define your logic based on the recurrent from a complex thing. 
and second is like if you have a already a matrix you want to perform the circular shifting these are very linear shifting kind of a thing in any kind of frequency data basically in machine learning we do the convolution operation quite often so to perform the convolution operation internally we do this kind of linear shifting and circular shifting operation so for circular convolution generally we need a circular shifting and for linear convolution we need the reset for this flip command does the purpose so circular shifting is also possible here if you see you have a matrix a and you want to perform it the shifting should be like a rotating kind of behavior not the individual element wise rotating we are doing we are taking the entire column shifting is two column along the two so along the column side we are doing two level translation so your first one is 159 so two column in it will go here and that's what is happening here you see here it's going to the one plus two so third column it's going there similarly other columns are also kind of a shifting like this way so this is known as a circular shifting if you want the shifting along the row then you have to put some number here that will does the up and down kind of a shifting here Another operation for mathematical side, we need some standard matrix like identity matrix is defined by I. If you specify one number, that takes a square identity. If you specify any row and column number, it takes a rectangular or square based on the numbers. Similarly, if you need a zero matrix or null matrix, you can get by zeros. And if you need all the elements of the matrix as one, that is also available. And diag terms actually extract a your dominant diagonal that is from the upper corner to the lower corner so left hand side to the right hand side and it is kind of a useful diagonal is specifically in the eigen decomposition application so where we try to diagonalize a linear system matrix in terms of the its diagonal components similarly noise analysis or uncertainty analysis you need a random matrix so that is also possible using random thing if you need a Gaussian random number, then you need to do another normal term that is and in. So that will give you a normalized distribution of the random matrix. So how does that look? Let's have some visualization. So ones are there. Since I am giving three, so it's a three ones. Similarly, it's a three, so it's a three by three matrix, identity matrix. And if you combine those combinations also possible like this way, you can see here. Operation wise, all the primary algebraic operations are supported for the matrix, addition, subtraction, and all those things. But there is one interesting thing here. If you see here, there are two types of multiplication and division thing is happening. One is regular multiplication, one is dot multiplication. So what is dot multiplication? So let's see. We take two matrices and we perform a regular matrix multiplication that is like row by column thing that is happening here. That's fine. Matrix actually does not perform the conventional matrix operation. Rather, it just maps each element of this A to the each element of the B. So 1 times 3 equals to 3. Similarly, 3 times 0 equals to 0. So in based on the index of the each matrix element, it just performs the whatever operation you are doing here. So that's the rule of the dot operation. Other is matrix inversion, so you can perform it using different way. There is a command called INV, so that will give you the matrix inversion. Or you can use the eigen decomposition. That is also another way of finding matrix inverse. So for getting the eigen vectors and eigen values, we have a default command of EIG. If it's a symmetric matrix, you can use EIGS or EIGH. H for Hermitian matrix. For convolution, you have a command called conf. So that will perform the convolution of two sequences P and Q. Now next is other thing like determinant calculation and um, norm calculation or rank calculation. That is the same number, whatever we talk in English, that is will give you that thing. And the other thing is symbolic operation. Like um, this is primarily used in the loop operation or other things. For loop, if loop, everything is supported in the MATLAB platform. So. If you want to perform a regular and then single and operation, if you need a logical and like a decision based thing, then it's kind of a double operation is required. Those are primarily matrix operation and algebraic operation we talk about. Let's go by the other thing we also perform using MATLAB. One of them is the differentiation and the next is the integration thing. 
So for differentiation, there are also three different types by default. Some advanced version also came up recently. So first is finite defense derivative. So that is kind of a, your we are assuming your differentiation actually exists and it's a finite, not no infinite number will arrive. Three common approaches. One is the very old one that is deep. That gives you first order derivative. If you want the second derivative, then d of sum again d of sum x. So d of d for some function that will give you the second derivative. So if you have a long number, that's a very long operation. So later people have come up with alternate these two solutions, gradient and del2. Del2 is actually Laplacian derivative and gradient is your regular vector gradient. We'll see for how does it perform. So x is the function you want to find out its first derivative. So this is your common. This is the logic it actually follows. If you x is a sequence, let's say 2, 3, 5, 6, 7 kind of a number sequence it has. If you run the diff of x, it's just with respect to the first element of x, that is x11, it is getting subtracted from the next element. For example, the second element will be x2 minus the previous one is x1, so x2 minus x1. Similarly, your second element will be x3 minus its previous element is x2, so like that. Way. This is the general form. So if you understand the dimension wise, if your x has a dimension of let's say 10, 10 cross 1, then your y will have a dimension of 9 cross 1 because it is very obvious because the, their first element it will be 0, so we ignore the first element. From the second element we start on. Now, if you have instead of a single vector, if you have a matrix kind of a data, like it can be anything, if by the dot command it can be 3, 4, 5, whatever the dimension of the matrix is there, that is also performable like this operation here. Now if you want, this is by default actually performing, if you see, performing along the first direction. That is your one second again, the first index, that is the matrix, that is the row. So the differentiation is performing across the row. If you want to perform it across the other direction, you have to give the numbers and that is called a dimension. So we'll come it later, but before that, if you want to perform like a nth order derivative, for your third derivative, then you have to give this number n equals to 3 here. So it will perform the same operation whatever we are doing, but instead of one time, it will perform it three times. So y1 will be this, then y2 will be for the y1, and y3 will be for the y2. Like that, iteratively, it will work on. Okay, now next one is if x is a matrix that I was talking, by default it takes the row wise data and performs the derivative. But if you want to perform along the column wise data, then your dimension will be 2. Now instead of x, instead of 2 cos 3 matrix, it's a 2 cos 3 cos 5, let's say, the array size. And you're going to perform along the third dimension, then that will be along the dimension will be 3. So if you don't give anything, n is taken as a 1, first derivative and dimension is taken as row that is also the first dimension. So how does that work? Let's see a one example. So if what you guess, this is I think 4 by 4. So your y will be 3, basically a 7 cos 1. So 1 cos 7, so now your first element will be definitely the first two elements same. So your second element is 1 minus 1 equals to 0. Then 2 minus 1, that is 1. 3 minus 2 equals to 1, like that it is going forward. Now you want to perform it with respect to double derivative. So first derivative will be something like, I think it will be 5 minus 0, 5, second one will be 15 minus 5, that is 10, like that. Again, you perform one more differentiation that will give you the second derivative, that is kind of a d square by dx square, you can think. So that is. This is basically how many dimensions? 3, 4, 7 dimensions. So your first derivative will be actually 6 dimension, and second derivative will be one more, one less, that is 5th dimension. So that's what is happening. Okay, now we have talked about all these vectors. Now let's take a one matrix. We did not mention anything, so it will take the first dimension n equals to 1, and dimension will be along the rows. So that's what is worth for me. If you see here, your 5 and this is 1, so 5 minus 1 equals to 4. 
Next will be 25 minus 5, that is 20. That's how it is performing. And since it's reducing along the row, so your row was previously 3 cross 3. Now it is 3 cross, a 2 cross 3. So one dimension is reduced across the row. Now if you specify exactly what you want to perform, so we want to perform along the column now. This is your data. So column then 7 minus 1, that will be 6. And uh, so like that, and now we are doing performing it over the two times, so that will be the two times cases. Okay. That is going to be the conventional differentiation that you see here. Deep we are still using. What is the step we are taking? We are taking a particular for any differentiation, we need a f of x plus h minus f of x by h. So that h is we are specifying as a step here. And what is the x range that we want to perform that you have given here? And this is your function that is sin x. So what we know, the first derivative of sin x, y, that will be cos x. Again, if you perform the cos x the, um, derivation, that will be minus sin x. So f is sin x, y is cos x, and z is minus sin x. And you have we have performed the operation, and we want to plot all three in the same plot. So if you see here, first one is plotting what? X times Y, so with the red color. Second one is kind of performing the function of the F, F is sin X and third one is Z. So that will be minus sin X actually. So that's how any function you can do, whatever the your objective is. Next one is differentiation thing. For the real time data, for example, if you have a run time, I have run it a couple of minutes, maybe half an hour ago, so it is today's date, 9.46 I have run, so it says now at that time, basically. if you run it now, it will take current time. So let's say you have a five such kind of data points, you want to find out the difference between each data points. So like it is 9.46, next one is 9.48, like that. If now this is a random number, how can you find out the time difference? So there you can just run with that data point, you can run the differentiation comment, deep t, that will give you. Now we know that everything is uniformly sampled, so 1.5 minutes. So that is kind of a 1 minute 30 second that's giving it in terms of thing. So this is useful for any real time data, how the data is delayed or something like that. You can perform this operation. Similarly, if you have a kind of a density data, how the density is varying or the thickness is varying, you can perform the differentiation. It's not necessarily to be time, it can be any data points. So it will give you the numbers of difference, how they are happening. So this is a standard deep operation. Next one, we'll talk about the gradient thing. If you have any vector field like that, uh, any number, like if we want to perform a 3D variation, 3D or any dimension, this is the general formulation. So for that case, you perform the derivation like this and it will give you the corresponding gradient theoretically but in numerical how can you get this thing let's say you have a function x square e to the minus x square minus y square and times x so and you want to that is z and you have a y also that is the x transpose i'm going to perform the gradient of this function over the plane of x and y so that's a two-dimensional equation up to this it will happen and for each of the derivative, that is, P, this is Px, this is Poi actually. So if you have more than three vectors or two vectors, it will add accordingly P1, P2, P3 like that way. So this is what we are getting. Next, the step, we are just plotting how this thing looking like. If you see here, the first plot, we are doing contour plot for the function z. Second one is we are doing kind of a weaver plot. So how does that look? Let's see. So contour plot is this one, this solid line, connected lines for the same, this function itself. And the second one is, Quiver is actually giving what is the derivative. So the this derivative, two derivatives we have. Now uh, if it is based on the direction of the derivative, it is increasing or decreasing, we can see. Or uh, if you think of a vector perspective, it is a sink or it's a source. If it is entering towards, it's a sink. If it is going outwards, means your flux is going outward. So your gradient is positive. So that kind of sense, not just the amplitude, also the 
direction information also you can get from the gradient function. So this is kind of useful for any kind of vector field. You can apply it and you can control all the color was and everything. So focusing on the differentiation side, we can choose one more very simple function x square plus x square times y cube. And we firstly plot the function, how does it look? It's a nice plot with a density maximum along this and minima along this. And now we just perform the gradient operation with respect to x and y for a particular points. So let's see how it looks. So fx does not at all similar to your function as expected because it has a x square variation. So next one is a y variation that is fy. Both of are quite I mean, not at all similar you can see. Only thing is both are kind of having a maxima along these two. But your resultant gradient should be a summation of both these in the vector summation not just a scalar summation. It should be a vector summation of these two variations. That is the derivative of that particular function. And the, okay, we don't have it. The numbers that is also possible by adding the absolute tolerance and relative tolerance. What is we want to go for the accuracy? Okay, next one differentiation operation is Laplacian differentiator. This is a very basic definition of any function u. You want to perform its in it derivative, so that is n. And here are different li limits we have given hx, hx, hy like that. Let it Let's say we'll see the example, then it will be more obvious. So if you do like this, taking a simple function x is 4 to plus y to the 4 and perform its first derivative. So that is the L. And delta u comma h, that is with respect to h, you are actually performing the operation. h is the step function that we saw the equation previously. And we want to visualize the L. How does that look? So that is kind of your derivation you can see here. It has a minima along the center points, which is a parabolic kind of equation, similar to the parabolic equation. And you get a maxima along the four corners. That is kind of expected behavior we are seeing. And you are plotting along the x and y plane. You can plot in other variables also. That is possible. And these are the first two arguments along which you are plotting. and along which parameter we are plotting that is the that is the input argument here. So what are the plots we learn here if you see here. This is a surface plot which only plots the magnitude no direction. If you want to see the linear plot no direction you can just use the sharp. But if you want to plot a linear plot without direction there is other way one is the default plot function is there and that is contour. If you want to add the kind of a direction with this, you can do the quiver. Quiver is applicable to both x and y and z also. You can add z, it's three dimensional is also possible. The different common variation we use. Okay, so I was talking about the differentiation till now. Similarly, we can perform the integration operation also. Very old function is integral. Like deep, we have the integral function. Now, this also by default it's a first order integration. For example, if you have a function x to the power 5 e to the power minus x times sine x, you want to perform this integration with respect to 0 to infinity level of x. And you have set up the error. If you don't set up anything, it will take the default value. Otherwise, you can control the up to how much accurate value. This is relative tolerance, this is absolute tolerance. And you can get the numbers what it is looking like. So it can be performed analytically. So you can perform analytically and match with the result. Now second is L2. L2 actually gives you the second integration. Similarly, L3 is gives you the third order integral, like a volume integration you can think of. Second one is surface integration. And first one is line integration. Now one can come up with a problem which has n eight order. Let's say fifth dimension or sixth dimension integration. You cannot write a new function every time. So what people do like one way is like it's a quadrature approach you can do. Other is the iterative approach. So we'll see one fourth dimensional integration later on. Now let's stick to these three the basic thing. 
third fourth one is quadrature quadrature is final uh, form kind of a thing in the recent literature very recently it has come adaptive integral method but quadrature is a quite stable solution for the last 50 years if you want to perform it in the 2d plane then you can have a, another variation that is quad 2d both are kind of a similar results okay let's do for the second order integration surface integral we have the same function ax square plus by square and what are the numbers we have we want to perform within this limit x equals to 0 to x equals to 5 and y equals to minus 5 to y equals to 0 we have a set the relative tolerance error and it will give you the actual numbers what you want to perform so after calling the integral to we have to pass the function whatever function we want to do since the function has the input argument x and y we are giving these two variable x and y so it determines the integration will be performed with respect to x and y and next is the limit of the x and y that's all the remaining things are kind of a you can think of a extra thing you end after zero that will also be fine and this will perform give you the approximate numbers of q Let's perform one more volume integral like the thing. We have three parameters volume integration. That's why three variables required x, y, g. And we have the limit for each variable here also. No other error performance or anything we are adding. And we are just calling integral t for the t third order performance. It's the numbers we are getting here. Now, coming back to the initial discussion, let's say we don't have a third order, either we have a fourth order thing or like that how we are going to perform that so there is a way first we already know the second order or third order integration we can perform what that again that's what we are doing here first we are performing we are defining the function whatever it is there four variables are there so since the four integration is happening let's perform the third up to three integration we are performing theta phi and xi so that is happening here like d eta d xi there is no variable so it's very easy so we are taking the xi operation here and we are getting the result but we still have to perform the 0 to 2 pi operation here so that is happening up to later on that is 0 to 2 so that is integral so three are done so one is remaining so we are taking just integral the first order integration here what that limit and that is performing the final output and you can compare it with uh, your analytical result that's a gamma function is there that is also some approximate number will come up that is going for the conventional integration approach now coming with the quadrature approach quadrature approach actually it's kind of a this function is expressed as a linear weighted sum so the weighting coefficient coming from the gaussian quadrature and the function is coming from a any kind of exponential expansion you can do it can do Taylor series or Maclaurin series, whatever you want, but it, the accuracy depends on the weighting coefficient that is coming from the quadrature properties of the cos quadrature rules. So this, the by default, it's a linear function. So you have only two limits, a and b. For example, this function we are performing cos quadrature, zero to one, for this thing. This is function definition input variable only x, and you perform the integration that gives you these numbers. Now. The other way is like not every time the functions are good enough, it might have one by zero configuration that is called a singularity. For example, this function you see here. So if I put j equals to half, then the, there will be one by zero configuration that's called a singularity point. That if you go by this way, that will create kind of a problem there because it will be infinite at certain location of j equals to one by two. And j equals to one by two falls in this range itself. So one thing you can do, you can define your own contour, like for a particular rectangle or particular circular contour, you can perform the integration. That's what we are doing here. And we are avoiding the singularity by defining a manual contour. And the contour can be inserted as a waypoint. So waypoints kind of a think of integration path points, you can think. So along that path only the integration will be performed. And you are getting some numbers based on that, that is, kind of a non means it's a finite number so no singularity issue is arising if you are accurate 
uh, need to get more accurate result, you need to quantify the error performance that is given by another input alg output argument that is error bound. It can be any variable name you can give. It's not necessary this name you need. And it will give what amount of error it's actually tolerating. And the other final thing is 2D integration that is a quotation 2D. Previously only AB was here because it was a one dimensional integration, so A and B was there. Now we have two dimensional integration, so CD is also appearing here. There also you can add the tolerance value in the input side that up to this level of relative tolerance or absolute tolerance we want to perform the operation. Otherwise you can do like this, the default thing. And similarly in the output also you can get the error bound, whatever you want. And this name value means actually the tolerance numbers and tolerance name is like Reltol gives you relative tolerance, Abstol gives you absolute tolerance thing. Let's perform the integration of this function in this range using the quad to do, the quad to d. So uh, in function definition, we need the function signature here and you need the input argument variables, what are x and y here. And then you are just calling quad to do and this is giving the limit, so we need to perform minus pi to 2 pi. And whatever the limit, this will be minus, I some think it's wrong. So, and this will be 0 to pi, that is fine. And if this is the numbers, you will get some results on this thing. Once you get everything, numbers and all those things, we still want to visualize the data points. So, very basic thing is plot, that is a linear plot. If you have multiple plots, you can do like this. Otherwise, if you want to plot the two variables along two different axes, you have plot y, y. So that will give you two different axes. So this is a linear plot. Surface plot we have seen there previously. Now the for linear plot, you can just control everything, whatever the names you want to plot here, legend or the axis and everything manually here, similar to Python thing. And for other things, different types of plot like just a not continuous if you want a stem plot like a bar number or something like that there are other functions just type help plot it will give you what are the variations is there similarly for 2d plot you have sharp maze contour and other things are there plot 2d all are there for volume or 3d plot you can still call the sharp you can still call the maze cuber and Plot 3, that is some extra thing. Some new functions are also added. You can explore it in the visualization site. Next thing is a little different thing. Like these are all kind of a common approach of programming, but if you go for a more advanced structure kind of a thing, then you need a object oriented programming approach. So this feature is also added a couple of years back in the MATLAB site. So you can define a particular method hierarchy and class level and you can perform whatever the kind of operation you want to do and the calling of this each variables or functions or methods are same similar to C++ so this is like the underground structure and you can leverage it. there is I think entire documentation on this initial implementation of object oriented concept you can leverage that few common Main function there is the class level that is a class level of your object. It can be anything based on your requirement. It's a numerical matrix or it's a class of the particular string array or something like that or any object number you want to do. Similarly, events like events give you what are the number object call you are doing there. So multiple times you are calling a particular classes, you need to store the history. For example, if you want to develop a particular interactive app, you click and define parts of the app for entering defined data points or you are updating a input data in the apps. So every time you call that function that is defined as a particular event. So that event log is also exportable. You can see the what are the events are being called in the last few times. Similarly, the methods. Methods is also a very common part of the OOPS concept and you can get defined kind of custom methods and you can use the inheritance properties very easily as we do in the any general object oriented cases. And what is the method supported? You can view from the methods view or any list of methods you can see. Properties, 
you can give a particular properties to a, your class variables and then you can give a name each as some numbers so it should be or you can give the properties like it should be always character or it should be always green like that you can define all those advanced operations next thing is debugging part so very basic debugging part is just putting a breakpoint every matlab command you will see this bar so if you want to debug one particular number just a click on this thing if you double click it will vanish again like that so every time you run this script it will stop at this step if you do step in the running operation then you will go to the next line otherwise you can enter into the whatever let's say it has a particular function name is there you want to enter into the details what this function includes you can do step in and it will show what are the internal function is happening going around so this is one way of debugging but command line debugging is also possible who prefer to do the command line programming approach there are different commands like up down echo or like a keyboard operation whatever the control things are also there but this is very restricted better you do in the interactive way that gives you more insight finally once let's say you have something you have done some codes and you have done a example or everything but you want you don't want to double work like you don't want to copy that again in word and all these things so there is a option of export in every function you can do that specifically in the example function dot mlx format you can export in terms of word file as a report or you can have the pdf or latex format whatever you want to do and even in this text you can enter any latex equation or image anything you can insert just like we do in the ms office or latex thing that function is also available and this is the common step like similar any documentation process so once you export the data point you can convert that if that's a coding file you can convert it into other files c++ python or mix that is doable or any report format you can do and perform your later of post processing operation based on your requirement thing so for more uh, literature i think you best definitely going to the documentation page some standard books we will follow but till now we for the machine learning side we only do the calculus and one thing we we'll talk about the other thing probability statistic side so if you have a large data point how you can actually Heat or apply the regression on this thing. We'll do hands-on on two examples. But before going that, any question till now? Okay. That sounds good. Okay. Uh, I request the participants, like if you have any query to sir, please raise the hand and uh, we will unmute you. Anybody in the participant size uh, side, please uh, raise the hand. If you have any query. Just wait. Uh, is there any questions from the participant si uh, side? Please uh, raise your hand. Yeah, that's fine. I think we can take question in the last. Okay. Thank you uh, so much, sir, for your insightful and extremely detailed tutorial for MATLAB. Thank you. Oh, uh, sir, I think uh, someone is there. Okay, I'll just. Uh, hi, sir. I'm Rakesh Mahatu from IIT Jodhpur, 
and uh, I'm wondering that uh, how this uh, MATLAB is useful in AI. Uh, If you have a question, just ask. Uh, I'm I'm wondering like uh, how this MATLAB is useful in AI, artificial intelligence and material engineering. Uh, can you uh, uh, like that? Can you correlate? Hello, uh, Rakesh sir, you can uh, proceed with your question. Uh, hello, hello. I'm audible. Hello. Uh, yes, uh, my question is. Uh, yes, my question is that uh, how this MATLAB is uh, uh, in correlation with material engineering and artificial intelligence. Can you uh, give light on that? OK, so that's a good question. So whatever the literature is going through, most of your material science experimental side, you need a lot of data points, right? Specifically, let's say glacier kinds of thing or this kind of material mining exploration. Two types of application I can think of. One is the you have a lot of raw data from some industry plants. You want to find out what are the important parameters of that data points that you need to choose and you can optimize the output of that plant. Like if you have a thermal plant or a material plant, so what will be the parameter input parameter you need to optimize and get the best output? So detection of this input parameter can be performed using MATLAB. There is something called design exploration of the input space. So that which is a beginning of the parametric optimization thing that can be performed using MATLAB. The other thing is to optimize any particular algorithm. Like if you have a other kind of simulation tools, but you cannot generate the data all the time. So if you want to interpolate or extrapolate a particular data points, you can leverage the MATLAB features very easily to create a intermediate data points, which is kind of sometimes we call it as a bootstrapping in the machine learning side. So this kind of data point generation is one way. The other thing is visualization because it has a lot of interactive apps. So you can use that data points to visualize in a in a favorable way to present to the author or whatever audience based on your requirement. So the machine learning part will be covered later on. It's not in this part of this lecture. You will have a second lecture on the machine learning using MATLAB thing. There are some open source toolboxes have been developed what I was going through for the specifically for the mat material science design process using MATLAB. You can explore that and you can integrate those toolbox in your existing MATLAB platform. That is also possible. I hope that kind of covers your question. Any doubts? Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, so I think uh, we don't have any further questions. So Okay. Thank you so much. So let's go to the hands on side. I think basically related to a couple of examples of fitting linear regression side. So I'll share a different file. Is my skin visible? Thank you. So the basic platform of MATLAB looks like this kind of it. This is your scripting platform. This is command window. And whatever the input or outcome variables that will be here. 
we don't have anything currently whatever the function you will have here that will be here also so that's how we'll do so first we'll do one computing example here let's load a particular data points we have two data points here temperature and thermal excitation parameters we see here once we run that particular example it is just showing that particular data each are column data 236 size so these are the temperature and corresponding thermal excitation coefficients are there like this now this is a very raw data if we just visualize this thing now we are just to get the uh, thing kind of way using an app We launch the pub fitting app where you can import these particular data points and do whatever you want to do, kind of a visualization site. So let's say select the data and I want to check the data points x data as temperature and y data is the other one coefficient excitation coefficient. Okay, so if you don't have any particular, I mean, we want to plot the temperature versus thermal excitation. And if you just an unfit configuration, you see it's a very petty, bad or poor performance. And if you want to perform the fitting over this data point so that we get a good looking equation or like this, so it is linear y equals to mx plus c that is shown here actually. So and sorry to interrupt, but black screen is showing. Visible. Okay, hold on. I think my screen is not visible. Okay. Okay, we have the data point. I think till now it was visible. Uh, app side, we are opening the app that is called a carb fitting app. And we want to select a particular carb data point. So let's go to the data. We have two data. And fit carb name, we can give anything. Untitled fit or whatever you say. Let's keep it like that. linear fit we can say your x variable will be temperature we are choosing and your y variable is thermal excitation okay so that's what we have this is your um, actual data point that's points data and it's not quite a good looking if you see the linear fitting it cannot capture the behavior of the variation with respect to temperature so what is the linear equation that is like this p1 x plus p2 y equals to mx plus c basically and this is your p1 and p2 variable for the linear and whatever the statistical variable is also here you see here goodness of fit gives you how accurate your error your rms is pretty high like 3.221 Similarly, R square and other values are also there. So it's not quite a good one. That's the bottom line. Now, if you want to go for the higher order fitting, nonlinear fitting, let's go here, change it to third order. So how does it look like? It's going near to capture the behavior. You see your expression, whatever the po polynomial fitting we are using here. And these are the parameters it is using. And every time we just approximate to this third order in thing we actually doing something like kind of error bound so these are the in the bracket it gives it the maximum and minimum error for each coefficients and you see your rms is kind of changing with respect to this, that thing and next thing if you want to more accurate let's go to the fifth order kind of captures whatever we want if you see the equation is badly conditioned, that's absolutely fine, but it 
skill captures whatever we are actually doing here and all the coefficient of the fifth order is kind of here. Next thing, if you want to make this model more robust, like if you add a noise or something like that, it still works quite up to certain error performance. You can choose this kind of robustness by square or linear error, whatever you want to do. Now this is how you can do. Now the other, this is kind of a polynomial fitting I am just showing here. If you see the top one, you have defined other types of fitting option is also there. One is the exponential thing. So let's see how good or bad it gives. It's not at all good here, which is kind of expected because we are choosing only the first term. And if you choose the next term, this kind of covers the thing. So you, for every type of fitting, you can get the actual error performance data automatically. So that helps you comparison of data which kind of fitting model you will choose. So for exponential till now up to second order is supported in the app. For polynomial up to ninth order it's supported. Let's see why the Gaussian case. It's pretty bad you can see here. And the equation that is following that is also showing up you can see here. So little upper Gaussian if you go, I think it should cover kind of, but it's still not that good as we are doing from the linear fitting. So linear fifth order was kind of accurate thing. And the Gaussian case, I think it's kind of, you see, it's kind of overfitting actually. The results in the upper point is just not at all matching the behavior. So better not to use this. So based on that, the visual isolation, you can get an idea what kind of fitting you need. Similar other options are there, multiple ways to regression models are there. These are you have the data point and within that data point only we are doing the performance. If you want to do the extrapol interpolation performance, like you don't have a data point for a particular temperature, like 450 you don't have a, let's say you have a data, you can use the interpolation operation for this thing. Similarly, any custom equation if you want to do, you can do like this. So you can write your own equation and get whatever you want to perform there. So this is by default equation. You can change it to anything you want to do. So by default, A into E to the minus Vx plus C. That's a very bad Y. So you can do something like that. C into X like this or something like this. It gives a different format of thing. If you are, know that this is this will be look like your particular closed form solution, then you can use it. Otherwise, use the conventional linear thing. That's a pretty good one and next one is what are the other things residual plot so this is kind of a your actual data point that is the discrete points and the continuous was is the regression fit what is the difference that you can get from the residual plot actually that gives you the error performance how much different the your prediction versus your actual data points you see the in a lower level it is not so good so error is pretty high but if you in the, go in the higher frequency, the error is significantly less than 0.5. This is kind of a makes sense. So it's exactly matching there. And the other thing, if it is a two day remains, two days are later, you can use this contour plot, which is disabled there. You can use a specific prediction bound. We did, we did the, take the a default case, no bound. You can customize to the particular error bounds here that up to 95% error I will tolerate. So that is possible. And if finally, you can validate your result also here. If you have a other data, like you, you have a thousand data points for 800 points you take for your testing the model or building the model. The remaining 200 data point you keep for the validation. You can choose that particular data point. Currently, we don't have it. We took the all the data points. So those testing data point you can load here and check what is the error performance and validation of your fitting model that is possible. And whatever performance of fitting we are done with this, you can finally export your results like this. Either the generate code or you can generate the figure, both are fine. If you want to do more like this, generate code or export to workspace, let's do by default thing. If you notice here, it gives you three options. I don't know it's visible for you. Okay. So there are three things we are actually saving. One is the model because it has the weighting coefficient you see here. Second one is what is the 
error performance, that is the goodness of the feed. That is this parameter that is storing. Third one is the results, whatever the structure it is generating that is being stored there. Now, if you go for the scripting thing for more advanced application, you can do the generate code and whatever we did there, that should be visualized here. So we have chosen fifth order, so it's a poly five. If you choose a third order, it's a poly three like that. Linear fit. This is plotting you the X data versus Y data. And finally, this is giving you the goodness of fit results, whatever the numbers you are getting there. And one is the original data, one next one is kind of the residual thing, whatever we plotted in the last. So that is the residual things. Now you can take this code. You don't know, no longer need the app at all. You can use this scripting for your whatever data points you want to run. So the X data and Y data will only change. Here it is temp and thermx, but you can do anything, any other parameter that you can do. So like that, if you even don't know the coding site, you can generate your code from the app thing. So this is one app. Similarly, there are multiple other apps you can explore here. I went to the first tab that is carb fitter. If you just scroll down, you have multiple types of, I think one is regression app, linear regression app OS there or something like that. So you can, some visualization app is also there. These are the machine learning apps that might be interesting for you. This is the regression learner app where you can do more advanced regression using the neural networks and all these things. Some neural network confirmance based feeding, like this is one of them, where you can construct a neural network and perform the feeding operation there. And classification app is also there. This will be covered in your next lecture more details. The other operation you might need that is kind of a optimization thing. I think this is the way. So from there you can do any type of optimization, 1D, 2D or 3D optimization that is possible. Different types of optimization algorithm also you can choose there. So that is one way of fitting example. Let's go for the other example that is design space exploration that I was mentioning. So this is the example that we are actually talking about. And to go to the location of the example or file location, you can just go to change to file that is common thing. Okay, so this actually talks about this thing. If you have a particular thermal equation of a reactor or something material, how you can actually model the its thermodynamics properties and all those things. This is a standard thermodynamics relation that we are going to model. These are the equation, CSTR equation for the reactor. And how the different input parameters sensitive to the output. So if I do a 10 percent change of the input parameter, how it big or small it will affect the output that we are going to analyze. So these are the parameters and this is your system model actually. So any plant based kind of a thing, you can build your model or you can, eat. this is a kind of a connecting blocks app based workflow, but you can do it in the scripting also if you have the input parameters. And these are your output, these are the, your input parameters. So we'll check based on the variation of the input, how the output is changing. So first building the model that is CSTR design problem, we, are, we already build this problem. And we are defining two design variables that will vary initially. That is a, a and H. What are A and H? A is kind of a height. H is the height and A, a is the surface area actually in meter square. And second is that will that will vary up to which range. So we are specifying a particular distribution within which it will range. So your A will vary up to 0.2 to 2 percent. So your minimum A and maximum A we are giving. Similarly, the range for the height we are giving like this. You can give based on your parameter definition. Now that will run for the entire parameter space. And finally, once we get, we can sample that parameter space for 30 sample points. So let's do perform that operation in the beginning.
clear okay so we have already built the model it will take some time to load the model Because it's actually internally launching the simulink thing, which gives you this block diagram. Any physical system can be modeled using this. Yes, so it came up. Yeah. So that's exactly we have the fit um, initial condition. We have the concentration and the temperature parameter and the coolant temperature. Everything is there. This is your thermodynamic system and this is your outputs. So let's extract the our input variables out of this model. So that is what we are doing here. Get parameter from the model. What are the parameters we want to extract? A and H. So now if you see your P here or you can type p here so it has two variable first variable is a whose default value is 0.5 minima and maxima are not defined so it's minus infinity to plus infinity similarly for the second variable it's h value is default value is 2 now we'll update its minima and maxima for each variables so that range we want to vary that particular parameter so let's first go for the A thing. A is the first one. So P1 is A. And second one is P2. Now if you type the P again. So we have given 0.2 and 2 for A and 0.5 and 3 for H. So you get the maximum minima things updated. But still, they are only the extreme points. You need the sample space between them. So that's what we are doing here. Now, P is your sample space. So if you want to visualize the sample space, there is something we'll show afterwards. With 30 sample points, we are just doing it. So this is, you are just discretizing within that maximum and minimum range. We are creating 30 data points for each A and H. So next one is we want to visualize the sample space. So scatter plot is kind of a two dimensional plot. That will give you the sample space. So you see here, so A and H. So first A, this is a correlation between A and H like this. Similarly, this is uh, this should be same because we, here also A and H are correlating. And for only for self correlation, that is kind of this. And for this is for H, this is for A. So this kind of sample space, you have the data points now. Next is at the uncertainty because any kind of, I means any system, this is not every parameter is control level. There should be some parameter that are beyond control, but we need to specify up to how much uncertainty in that parameters we can tolerate. So for this example, we are choosing these two parameters as the uncertain variables. So based on your particular plant model, you can do here. We are choosing these two as the uncertain variables. And this is similar to the thing. We are actually kind of discretizing or sampling this space. But manual, instead of manual doing, we are considering a probability distribution. This is a normal distribution. So that is a Gaussian thing. So the distribution type is normal. And let's run this thing. So that is your uncertainty parameter. These are the values. And what are the distribution type? Both are normal distribution. So it has mu, sigma. Everything is controllable. You can specify whatever the mu, sigma value you want to do. Otherwise, you can do it the default thing. 
so and this has the rank correlation is currently empty but you can specify the correlation between those two variables that will be 2 by 2 matrix because you have a two variables okay first visual we are just doing those rank correlation here if you don't know this you can put it empty that is also fine it will work and then scattering that uncertain space previously we have seen the same in known input space now we are seeing the unknown input space so this looks like this should come in the same plot yep so if you want a separate plot i have to add a figure before that anyway so these are the two variables and they are the distribution across each other so we are actually plotting one variable across the other so that's the, what is performing next is and we are defining it in terms of 60 sample space previously we had only if you see the u sample i think you will get a idea your p sample is 30 because we have sample space is 30 but here it is 60 point data points we are doing so that's why 60 data points is happening now next is how many variables we get till now so 30 times 60 so your total data space is now 1800 actually so you will run that transparency experience actually we are doing monte carlo here so based on that it will perform for all the 1800 points it will perform a particular distribution and then run the model 1800 times and get whatever the output results we are getting so for output results we are actually logging it in a particular object you see here this is kind of object oriented programming approach because we have a common object that is concentration underneath that object we have the multiple variables we are storing here in the hierarchy way so any types of variable you can actually define based on your requirement and then actually perform whatever you have this is my logging information i am interested but based on your requirement you can change it so this is all set i think to perform the uncertainty test simulation is should be all are done now just run the experiment evaluation will run it yeah yeah we'll take the question after what yeah, yeah. so let's do this thing for all sample space and unknown sample space it will perform the experiment we take some time because it will run for a particular all 1800 samples in between okay we can take the question in between if you have yeah so if anybody has a question please uh, raise the hand the participant size uh, side if anybody has a <coughs> query please uh, raise the hand okay 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 yes Uh, I think oh, you can proceed, you can proceed with the uh, question. Uh, who's this? The guest side who is uh, raising the hand. Please proceed with your question. We have unmuted you.
Yes. Okay. So I think it's taking a longer time to learn. So because I'm learning from a laptop thing and we have 1800 points. So anyhow, so the output will once you run this experiment, you can get an output of your cost function as well as the costing constant. So that will coming out to be like this. Now, if you have a specific requirement, like say I need a particular amount of data point that will be useful for my output. So you can run this particular limit within that. It will give you the like here we are saying that we need up to 50, 60 points or like that. So that will just truncate the entire data space into your available limit. So this is the A and H combination that will satisfy your requirement of F total. That is your output function. So like that now you can choose the best AH combination out of this. For example, here we can run the maximum or minimum out of this. Here the minimum function is minimum F total is being find out. So that is coming out to be like mean of the Y dot F. Y is your output variable. Inside that F is one of the variable. So that will give you the first index you can choose and that is your F value 2.1 value you want to get and for that case you need this combination of of A and H that will give you particular that F value. Now if you are satisfied with that thing you are it's all good. If you are not. Yeah, I think it's done. We can see here. The scatter data is now coming like this way. Now, if you want to do more kind of a sorting, like I don't need all the A and H, I need a particular level that will satisfy my output level. So then you can just perform this. And this is the range that up to A and H, this combination you can achieve your goal. But again, you need to find out the exact A and H combination. So what we are doing here, we are finding out the best combination out of that. That is here. So that is your A and H value that will satisfy that particular A value. So based on that, you can choose your input configuration of a plant or any kind of a manufacturing thing, which will satisfy your required output. So this is kind of a choosing the design variables intelligently instead of randomly running parametric variation and all those things. This is one way. Now if you are not satisfied till now with these particular numbers, you can further sync your design optimization area within this range. So we get a rough idea that we will get around these values, we get around these values. So we are in doing more kind of a smoothing the gap. So around 1.9 we are setting the variation now around 2.3 we are just varying the variation now and perform the operation one more time but it will no longer run the entire experiment it will only you have the data point already right in the graph so based on that data point it will fit the data within this range so it saves your timing so in the this range it is actually using the linear fitting or non-linear fitting approach and give you what will be the best number within this range. So we have run this thing. Now we can just do the scatter plot again. So you see your scatter plot changes from the previous distribution. So it's now only 1.5 to 2 range and this is 2 to 3 range. So fine tuning you can do again based on the cost value. You get the evaluate within that small range and this will give you the final if variation so again that will take some time so yeah this will be a new graph of f total out of new graph you can get the best function as we did in the previous case like this here so instead of previously it was 1.93 now it is coming i think 1.9271 2.3887 your next level of best number is coming like this so you see your cost is actually reducing means your error is reducing and you are going closer to the more accurate input configuration that you can achieve so this type of approach you can follow this is just a very simple model but in practical any kind of metallurgical plant you have almost more than 100 kind of input configuration 
So you have to choose what are the possible combination of A and AH or A1, A2, A3 kind of a thing that will give you the best result. So that kind of operation you can perform easily using the linear fitting in MATLAB. So that's all I have any question now. I'll share the link with your professor so that they can get an idea and share with you. Yep. Any questions from the audience? question that is also we understand we acknowledge it that you have understood it if you have any doubts you have my mail you can send drop me a mail and whoever the students in the institute they can also directly contact me in my office Open. yeah thank, thank, you. You. thank, you. thank you okay thank you sir uh, so here we are ending the session too and uh, we will meet for the third session in the second half that starts from 2 p.m. So thank you everyone. Thank you. Bye.